is the internet, because irony is real. And I've befriended all of my favorite editorial cartoonists. You can do that. Yeah. Steve Brodner, unbelievable. P.S. Mueller, unbelievable. These guys are delighted to share the cartoons that don't get printed with you. To, to rein it back in from the queen. So aren't you glad to prepare all these notes and we're not going to let you get to it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to rein it back in a little bit instead of talking about uh, uh, our favorite artistic uh, veins. Let's talk about cartoons that are relevant to skeptics um, and methods of, of transferring information to people via cartoons. Um, uh, cartoons have been compared to propaganda, they've been used as propaganda, and in a lot of ways they use sort of the tools of the enemy against the enemy, if you if you harness the power of, of what we're talking about. Anecdotes, emotional manipulation through the narrative, use of fantasy and mythology, um, use of emotion. Uh, these are all things that skeptics and science-minded people kind of want to stay away from because we want just the data and the facts. But as, as Edward Tufte once said, who's a brilliant, brilliant uh, infographic designer, uh, good design brings absolute attention to data. And so by by putting it all together in a good cartoon, you can present very complicated ideas. Um, now, as far as humorous cartoons, this is Matthew Inman of The Oatmeal. I'm sure you guys are familiar with his style. Anybody, does anybody not know what The Oatmeal is? Or all of you know what The Oatmeal is. Uh, he told me once that although cartoons can change the world and you can get some really powerful statements through them, really educational statements, you have to sandwich in between you have to sandwich these important ideas in between obese cats and barfing babies. <laughs> Otherwise you lose people. Otherwise you lose your audience. Um, uh, Dan, the science enthusiast, who is one of the science aggregators who puts stuff out on Facebook all the time, uh, he coined this term called reverse wolfing. So in your um, analogy, the barfing baby is a dessert? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, barfing okay. babies are informational dessert. Gotcha. And, uh, this term called reverse wolfing. You guys know who David Avocado Wolf is? Yeah, yeah that's a quick one I did of him. Uh, his method of getting pseudoscience and crap out there is he sandwiches it in every five or ten pictures of a sunset with a really inspirational quote. Oh, and then the next one will tell you how you know chemtrails are killing you, or medicine is bad because it's Western, or chocolate is magic because it raises things an octave of light, or some, something like that. Uh, I understand but, the first part of the chop and I'm in the second part. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when when David Avocado Wolf does it, you know, it, he's he, he's he's putting these tinctures of bullshit out there along with this happy stuff. And when the Credible Hulk does it, he's you know he's putting out real information in between you know funny pictures of cats with math memes. Um, what sort of ways? Now this is sneaky. Doing this is a sneaky way of feeding people information. What can you guys tell me about how cartoons are sneaky and how you maybe have used that yourself? How you've seen it used successfully or not? Um, I know I slipped. We had a new management takeover the paper I was working at and uh, suddenly a lot of our articles became very quick baby. And so in, in a cartoon I slipped in the headline uh, something like five Thanksgiving meals, meals you won't believe will change your life. It was just there in the middle of it, and I'm sure three or four people got it and laughed at it, and maybe somebody saw and thought about it. But it... Well, one of the things I'm doing is I'm, I'm preparing a coloring book, because I think it's important that this latest phase be jumped on properly, and it's <laughs> and exploited. And exploited. It, it, it's tentatively entitled "Great Moments in Religion." <laughs> Actually, or a friend suggested "Religion's Greatest Hits," but that had a more violent sensibility. And Lee's just reminded me that I, I jumped over a very important thing. Lee has brought a page, and we're going to have you guys try and think like cartoonists Ooh. and summarize something in a very quick. Boil down fashion. It, it is difficult to boil down an idea and keep it correct to one sentence. But so, so I drew this and I've, funny. I've wanted to draw this cartoon for twenty years, and I keep telling this cartoon at parties, which isn't the same thing. <laughs> so I drew it up, and I thought, oh, I should, oh, I should do that New Yorker thing. They'll do a cartoon, and then they'll ask people for their captions. So let's have a caption contest. <laughs> And Celeste has brought uh, uh, some prizes, and I've got uh, some small gods, which I'll be showing in the hallway. Yeah. 
if you don't want to participate, just pass the stack down, pass it down. And anybody who wins, now, if you come up with a good caption, turn it into Lee. Lee's not hard to find. He stands out in I'll the crowd. I'll be really easy to find. I'll be and the winning caption is going to get a classic comic strips quiz deck and a set of creature cards. Mm -hmm. And the small god of your choice from my table. And uh, hopefully, we're going to have some some very hard choices to make. And that's, that's Are we going to post these caps? Are you going to post the caps oh, somewhere? Ah, well, I, we'll figure that out. Okay. I, but, but by 5 o'clock tonight, let's make the deadline 5 o'clock tonight. So look at it over lunch. And you can figure out whether now. If I was your art director, I would have had that ship a little bit bigger, because that, that there's there's like a little Christian ship. Celestia worked as an editor for a long time. <laughs> but, but see, this is where you push back against your editor and you say, yes, but the whole point of the cartoon, from my point of view, is that the thing that's coming is really tiny enough. Oh, you gotta make them work for it. Yeah. There are books on how cartoons work on the mind. Uh, Scott McCloud, Understanding Comics. Yeah brilliant text on how people take in information differently when they're reading a comic or a cartoon. Uh, Stand-up comedians and magicians have talked about this and getting skeptical ideas across. The humor breaks down defenses. If you come at somebody, we were, we're, we were all of us were chit-chatting like right after that panel yesterday. Oh, battery's running along the computer, somebody. Uh oh. Uh, so, cord, yeah. I, um, so, <laughs> Somebody pray for the computer, yes. <laughs> So just like a stand-up comedian or a magician can break down people's defenses, cartoons absolutely can do that. And they can do that in a private way. They can do that, you know, it's, the person isn't being uh, bombarded by a quote-unquote frontal assault in the middle of, of a discussion or a debate or a, a church or a, a stand-up club. They're in the comfort of their own home in their pajamas, reading something on the internet, and they can sit there and think about a cartoon for a while, and it can work its magic. Once you get them laughing, you get their, you get their attention. Yes, yeah. once you have them laughing, and then they start thinking, well, why am I laughing? I'm laughing because that, that's funny. Why is that funny? Well, because it's kind of true, and it goes against everything I've been taught. Huh. Are we still on Sneaky? Yeah. <laughs> One thing I'd like to go really quickly to, though, is to say that because we use the word comics, comics is a misnomer, okay? It's ne they've never been all funny. Um, and yes, a laugh is one way to get people to see absurdity and contradiction. That's what all satire is about, right? Uh, you exaggerate something that's real and thereby point it up. Personally, I'm confessing to this room that I, as a cartoonist and as somebody who's drawn a lot of satirical and, and, and ridiculing type cartoons, I'm despairing of the, uh, the virtue and value, but not despairing, but I'm, my faith in ridicule and satire has been severely impaired by the events of the last year. <laughs> you all laugh so you know what I'm talking about. It, it's not, we're so not, powerful. Can we, you, you know, this proves how powerful cartoonists are and, and satirists that Donald Trump was elected. We've managed to alter reality so that we live in a satire now. It's not worth it. It's not. Right, but but in, the, in, in, in the realm of just this, but humor is, is a way to get under the door, over the transom. Just a, and this is the point Celeste made, and I was afraid she was going to bring up Jack Chick before I did. Look, it's Jack Chick on the screen, everybody. Can you get look at Jack that. Chick up on the screen? Um, is that you, uh, she alluded to this earlier, you don't need to be funny. You just need to have an en engaging, well-edited pictures, because what drags people in is the instantaneous visual effect. Uh, Jack Chick was hilarious. Now you well, you should probably see if people remember who Jack Chick is. We still is. haven't got Jack, Jack Chick up on the screen. We got him on the screen. It's, 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 uh, there is Jack. Uh, Satan loves Halloween because it glamorizes the power of darkness, drawing little kids into his camp. And it's paying off. Witchcraft is exploding among teens today. The Lord hates Halloween and its evil origin. Satanic human sacrifices are a slap in God's face. <laughs> this is intent not intentional humor. <laughs> Jack Chick was completely serious, and he was very successful, and he produced thousands and thousands millions of Millions and millions. Index, yeah, actual copy, but hundreds of titles yeah. of these little index side comic books, in, uh, index card size comic books. How many of you have ever seen one of these on a bus? Yeah. Usually they're on buses. You can find them on your favorite so. urinals. Yeah. There's a documentary called God's Cartoonist that's all about him. You should, 
Now, this is a yeah. confession. It's kind of a confession I have to make. I'm a pretty well-established non-theist. My rational mind overrules my primitive superstitious mind, which is still there, but it overrules it. Jack Chick goes right to the primitive superstitious mind. The way he does it is by combining words which are accompanied by really compelling graphics. If somebody handed you a six-page brochure, all type, talking to you about the book of Revelations and how it spells everything out for us in the future, how many of you would get past page one? No. <laughs> like that. You draw some pretty demons with it. You draw demons. You draw people roasting in hell. Make a pentagram. You draw, you draw a very blank every man or every woman kind of figure. And this is key. Every man, every woman are very important in cartoons. Because if you draw a blank, you know, this is not a black guy, a white guy, it's just a guy. The more generic you can make it, the more the reader identifies with it. So you identify in a line, yep. But you identify with it and, and you're you're sucked in. Uh, Scott McCloud in Understanding Comics talks a lot about what he calls the masking effect. How instead of particularizing a character, you look at Ten Ten, Ten Ten comics. And all the people in the comics have these blank mask-like faces. The real backgrounds and the boats and the airplanes are all highly realistic. It's a way of sucking you in. But the thing is that comics are a powerful infor informational tool by the virtue of the fact that they get in under the radar. If they can get in under the, the atheist's radar and make a little tiny part of my brain, a little primitive part of my brain says, oh no, what if it's all true and I'm going to roast in a lake of fire? That little voice pops up, especially if you grow up in a Catholic church or any, any myth-heavy environment like that. <laughs> if it works for Jack Chick, it can, surely should work for rationalists. <laughs> that we can distribute our own, well, I'm going to call him Jack Chuck. You know, <laughs> because my name's Chuck, just Tom Chuck, comics. Tom Chuck, publications. I want a funder. <laughs> uh, but really, we could we could do such a lot of good by explaining. This is where I, I was saying to somebody yesterday that the, the skeptics and atheist labels are unfortunately negative in context. That you're skeptical of something. You're against God. What are we for? We're fat in favor of reason and science and facts. And I think comics can do and have done a great job of this stuff in the past, but it's always been kind of bad art, you know, a lot of it. There's um, a lot of bad art out you know, there, yeah. Every Classics Illustrated comic books, and none of you? They actually did a pretty good job of laying out the classics. I feel like I actually read H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. No, I just read the comic book. <laughs> but step for step, it was very faithful. But the art was kind of bad. Now, I'm not saying they need to be brilliant yeah. art, but they need to be readable art. Now, I'm going to segue into, into one of the things I wanted to ask you guys, uh, um, the psychological pull and the teaching without informing people that you're teaching. Because, uh, yeah, I agree. Jack Trick, I, I disagree with everything that Jack Chick tracks talk about or teach. I disagree. I, I don't believe any of it. But if you handed me a Jack, Trick, a, a Jack Chick tract right now, I would keep it and I would read it later. Does anyone Absolutely. want a Jack? Oh, oh, he's got he's got his own parodies of Jack Chicks right here. So, so there's this there's this famous story about the the man who discovers the pot of gold and the leprechaun and tying the ribbon around the tree and the court bastard wakes up and there's a ribbon around every tree and he can't find his pot of gold. <laughs> That's the strategy that I'm using as early and often as I can because. We live in a marketplace of ideas, and if you've got a lot of gods, say small gods to choose from, good, good on you. But years ago, someone thrust a bad trifled flyer into my hand and said, you need this. <laughs> and it didn't look like this. It was really ugly. It had no graphics at all. And I opened it up, and it said, in the beginning, there was Godzilla. <laughs> so while these guys are doing their thing, I'm going to pass some of these out. Raise your hand if you want one. We brought goodies for everybody. Yeah. Good hand up. Well, I want to tell you guys about a comic that I learned about called Becca Do It Says I Mean. And it, uh, 
it does, it, it's a great analogy. I don't have any hard data on this. If there's any st statisticians or psychologists out there who want to do a study on this, please do. But I heard uh, Samantha Jacobite, who did her master's thesis on this comic, it was only published in the Louisiana area, and it was aimed at Cajuns. And I'm thinking of this as a great analogy comic because it was published uh, bilingually, but see the Cajun language, Cajuns in that region, that particular type of Cajuns that this was aimed at, they were illiterate and they were, they were more than illiterate, they were non-literate. They had no interest in learning how to read. It wasn't for them, they were just, they were kind of backwoodsy and proud of it and they had no interest. And this comic started coming out and it was published from the late 60s into the early 90s. It's called Bec du et ses amis. And all the word bubbles there are in Cajun French. And then it does have English translations there. And slowly, people who had no interest in reading began to pick up this comic. They see their kids reading it because they're the kids who went to school and learned some Parisian French, how to read the words, and new English. They read this as a family and without meaning to, these Cajuns learned how to read. And that's kind of what I view as science education. You got these people, I don't need to learn about evolution. I don't need to learn this. I don't need to do this. Well, let's give them something interesting to look at that you can't get the jokes unless you understand the theory of evolution. You can't get the jokes unless you understand the premise of what a scientific theory is versus just the colloquial use of it. Um, and I, I just, that gave me hope when I heard her presentation, when I heard, I heard her speak about this, the, the transformative power that this had on uh, what they called uh, a cultural literacy in the Cajun community. And it took them 30 years, but you know, here's hoping. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about, it, it changed their mind. It changed their mind about how important reading was because they wanted to get the joke. Um, jokes are memorable. We like it, it helps us learn. You guys remember, uh, Remember biology class, the Krebs cycle, that string of ATP and, and you know everything you had to memorize? Some of us went to school a little before you did. <laughs> that might not have <laughs> ATP was when I decided that I was not going to be a scientist. It was when I looked at that and I said, no. is, is that aliens versus predators? <laughs> yes. No. No, that's AVP. It's so confusing. The only way that I memorized that biological cycle of, of, of of, of, yeah, of, of energy was to turn it into a cartoon. And I had the molecules punching the other molecules. And I had, I had them stealing ions and electrons and, and I gave them little faces, little everyman faces. And it was the only way I was able to memorize it. And I think if it works for me, it can work for a lot of other people. All of, all of you guys who give me the end girls, beings, gave me this giant pile of answers, and they're fabulous. And some of them spoke on certain themes, a wall came up again and again. <laughs> but, uh, oh yeah, so, I think I might have a blank one here, there we go. Anyway, the gist is, there is this giant Mayan pyramid, there's a couple of lovely, lovely well-dressed Mayans atop it, looking down on an oncoming boat fraught with conquistadors. And the trick is, what are these people saying? What does this mean? How does this work? And that whole pile, that beautiful pile, not a single person wrote the caption that I designed the cartoon for. <laughs> and that makes me almost unspeakably happy, because what, because what you wrote is hilarious. All right, and they span a huge range. So first I want to share a little bit of the range. We're going to need a bigger pyramid. <laughs> They're going to make the Americas great again. <laughs> I predict that there will be several hundred years of cultural subjugation and oppression, essentially ending in genocide. This will be followed by the publication of a glib cartoon that badly summarizes these events. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they bring blankets. <laughs> too soon, too soon. Too soon. <laughs> Not to worry, a social system based on imaginary entities will continue. <laughs> <laughs> and
And then, with so many, with such a range, um, first I'm going to tell you why I made the cartoon. I used to talk about this in parties. I'm like, one day I'm going to make a cartoon, and it'll look just like this. And one guy would be saying to the other guy, oh, thank God, at last, we have a real religion instead of this nonsense mythology we've been believing. <laughs> because if I can leave you with anything, it's use the word mythology correctly, use the word religion correctly. Ask your bookstores why the Delars book of Greek myth isn't in the religious section. It's, it's a valuable tool. But what we ended up with were two cartoons that were almost identically labeled, and I loved them. And this is where it gets tricky, so we've got a couple presents for the, for the winners. One of them is this, this man with the fantastic mustaches, oh. Colin, who says, don't worry about it. Calendar says we're good until 2012. Uh -huh. <laughs> but with a cartoon, every word counts. And emphasis and subtlety are part of the language we bring to the party. The other one says, I thought you said this wouldn't happen until 2012. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, the second one's a little bit better. But it's all in the eye of the beholder, or in the case of Tom especially, the editor at the New Yorker, right? <laughs> What's going to make the cut? So, if yours was one of these that we read, meet me out in the hallway and we'll, we'll exchange grades and we'll be swell. <laughs>